Today, our speaker is Nima Akani Ahmed. Nima has been a professor in our School of Natural Sciences since January 2008. He was born in Texas and took his bachelor's degree in mathematics and physics from the University of Toronto. And he completed his PhD in physics from the University of California in Berkeley in 1997. After spending a year at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, he returned to Berkeley as an assistant professor two years later. And he then moved on to Harvard, first as a visiting professor and then becoming professor of physics in 2002. Nima is one of the world's leading theoretical particle physicists with a quite extraordinary range of contributions explaining, amongst other things, how the extreme weakness of gravity relative to the other fundamental forces might be explained by the existence of extra dimensions to space. And he's also taken a lead in, in proposing new theories that can be tested at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. In his recent work, he's been exploring how the mathematical structure of the quantum field theories used to describe fundamental forces might throw light on the structure of space and time at the smallest distances. Nima's work has been recognized by many awards, including the Griebhoff Prize of the European Physical Society and the Raymond and Betty Sackler Prize in Physics. In 2009, he was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And today, Nima's subject is space, time, quantum mechanics, and the Large Hadron Collider. Well, it's a wonderful pleasure to be giving um, uh, this uh, lecture today. Uh, I should say this is likely going to be uh, the very last public lecture of this sort uh, that I will certainly ever give after um, uh, a decade or so of giving a number of public lectures of this sort. And the real reason is that the main star of the show for this past decade has been this gadget, the Large Hadron Collider, which for much of this period in the last 10 years has always been five years in the future. For many years, that was a, a true statement, no matter what year uh, the statement was made. Uh, but incredibly, it's now on. Uh, it's working spectacularly well. And uh, we hope to, to get uh, some answers to at least some of the really profound mysteries that uh, that have been raised in our attempt to understand the two old things, uh, the, the revolutions in our understanding of space-time and quantum mechanics that, that started in the beginning of the last century, um, as I will try to explain in this lecture. So this is the real star of the show, uh, but what I want to do today is uh, put the physics that we're talking about uh, at the LHC in, in, its, in what I think is its proper context, so uh, you can better appreciate what, what issues are at stake, because there, there's really some fairly dramatic uh, fundamental questions at stake, and, um, uh, and, and I, want, I want you to, to understand why we think it's so important. So to do that, we're going to have to start with a lightning review of the last 400 years or so of our understanding of uh, fundamental physics. So uh, we have a picture of, uh, of really everything in the universe that we've measured and that, we've, um, uh, uh, that, that, that we understand that involves four basic interactions. There are famous old ones like uh, gravity that keeps the Earth going around the sun, keeps our feet on the Earth, and so on. There is uh, elect uh, electricity and magnetism that were known to the ancients, um, as well as some other interactions that we learned about in the beginning of the 20th century, um, the weak interactions that are responsible for radioactivity, and the strong interactions that, amongst other things, hold protons and neutrons inside uh, the atomic nucleus. And these interactions hold sway over a gigantic range of scales. So this is a, a cartoon of all the distance scales that we know about. Um, uh, in nature. At the very, very largest scales, uh, we have the size of the observable universe. It's around 10 to the plus 28 centimeters in size. The universe is expanding. There it is, happily expanding away. Uh, and really, every, every decade, as we go to smaller distances, something exciting happens. I haven't, uh, I haven't put them all in in this picture, but around a million times smaller in the universe, we have galaxies. Um, uh, the Earth-Sun distance is around 10 to the 13 centimeters. People are around 100 centimeters tall. Uh, atoms are around 10 to the minus 8 centimeters big. Protons and neutrons, which are the constituents of the nucleus, are around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters uh, in size. 
Uh, and uh, and I've, I've picked out two special length scales here. Obviously, the size of the universe, observable universe, is, is an important uh, uh, length scale to fundamental physics. But there's another one that we're going to spend a long time talking about in this lecture, which uh, we might as well give a name to right away. It's around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Um, it uh, has many names. One of them is uh, the weak scale. And uh, this picture is chosen to give you an idea also of the of the current frontiers. So obviously, the very largest distances, there's various cosmological experiments that are probing uh, the nature of the universe on the very largest scales. And today, uh, at our highest energy accelerators, well, before the LHC, not today, but before the LHC, the highest energy accelerators had gone to distances at around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, 100 times smaller than the atomic nucleus. And we're about to go to 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, 1,000 times smaller than the atomic nucleus, a factor of 10. Uh, uh, smaller distances than we've ever been to before. Okay? Now, just to give you an, a, an idea, uh, every factor of 10 in this business takes real work. Um, uh, roughly speaking, in, in the early 50s, uh, we had gone down to distances comparable to the size of the atomic nucleus, around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters. So it took us 50 years to go from 10 to the minus 14 centimeters to a thorough explanation thorough exploration of a factor of 100 down to around 10 to the minus 60. The fact that we're about to go another factor of 10 down to 10 to the minus 17 centimeters is cause for some excitement and celebration uh, all by itself. It is the current frontier of, uh, of our understanding of nature at the very shortest distances. But as I'll describe, there's another reason to be excited about this length scale. It isn't, it, it isn't exciting simply because it happens to be the current experimental frontier. It is the current experimental frontier, but it's not exciting simply for that reason. We've known about this length scale for a very long time. We've known about its existence. We've known that something interesting is going on around here um, for, uh, d depending on how you think about it, between, uh, between 50 and 70 years. Um, and so the whole time, it would have been an interesting question. What happens at around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters? Well, if you ask this interesting question in 1960, tough luck. You've got to wait a long time before you, uh, b before you find out. Uh, we happen to be in that epoch where we're about to go there and, and find out what is happening. And, and as, as you'll see in the rest of the talk, um, uh, we, we expect something, something important uh, to happen here. All right. So since I'm a... Uh, 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 all that physics in there is, is extremely interesting, but let's clean up the picture a little bit and uh, talk about the scales that uh, we obsess about over there in Bloomberg Hall. Um, so it's, they're the same two scales that I talked about a second ago, the Hubble scale and the weak scale. There's a third length scale, which is vastly smaller even than those two. It's around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So this is around 16 orders of magnitude smaller still than where we're about to go to here. Uh, that's called the Planck length. As we'll see, the Planck length is associated with, uh, with important gravitational effects, and its extreme tininess is a reflection of how weak gravity is compared to all the other interactions. So these, these are the three scales that, that most uh, theoretical physicists of, of, of uh, our ilk spend our time thinking about. Um, and the reason is that this picture is associated, every single line in this picture is associated with some very basic crisis or paradox in our understanding of physics today. One of them is associated with the very shortest distances. As I mentioned, that has something to do with gravity. And as, as, as I'll discuss uh, briefly for the purposes of this lecture, um, there's lots of reasons to suspect that physics near the scale strongly, uh, thought experiments strongly suggest that at around the scale, the very notion of space and time itself breaks down and has to be replaced by something else. Uh, so that's, that's a fairly dramatic thing. Uh, there's another. Uh, important and obvious feature of this picture, which is that these gigantic separations of, uh, between these scales. The universe is a huge place compared to any of these microscopic distances. And very, very roughly speaking, you know, it's the microscopic physics of the subatomic particles uh, has to do with these minuscule distances, and yet the universe is gigantic. Um, that may not seem like it's such a big mystery. There's lots of things in the world that are big that are made out of small things. Elephants are big, even though they're made out of atoms. Um, uh, you don't normally think of that as a, uh, uh, as a, a significant challenge to um, our understanding of theoretical physics. But it turns out if you ask enough why questions, even why the elephant is big <laughs> is mysterious. Okay? And it all boils down. The, the reason anything is macroscopic at all, the reason there's any macroscopic physics to speak of at all, 
um, boils down to a question that we currently have a terrible answer to, as I will, I will describe in the rest of the talk. And it's actually a really major puzzle why there's a macroscopic universe at all. Given, given the physics that we know uh, and love um, that works spectacularly well in other contexts, it remains a huge mystery why it is that there's a macroscopic uh, world at all. So these gigantic separations of scales between the big universe and these tiny microphysical scales uh, is a very major puzzle that, that uh, we, we have to confront. All right, so, um, so here's the uh, lightning review. Uh, there's, a, there's been a persistent theme uh, over the last 400 years, really starting with Newton, uh, that as we discover more and more about nature, we, uh, we find out that things that seem to be extremely different turn out to be different aspects of the same thing. So this is the uh, basic theme of unification. And Newton realized the same force of gravity that, uh, that, that draws the apple to the earth keeps the moon going around the earth. Uh, that's so obvious now we teach it in kindergarten or whenever we teach it. Um, but, uh, but, it but it was not obvious at all. It, took, uh, it was an act of genius for Newton to realize that, that, that this, this was true. Uh, also, electricity it has something to do with thunderbolts, magnetism. It has something to do with these funny rocks that attract and repel each other. These seem to have nothing to do with each other, and yet we, we, we understood in the 1800s that these were different aspects of the, of the same thing, and that light, which was a third thing that seemed to have nothing to do with these two, was actually an undulation of electric and magnetic fields. This, this journey uh, really intensified in, in the last century, uh, starting with, with relativity, uh, that told us that time and space are different aspects uh, of, of the same thing. And really, every time we've had one of these unifications, there have been other associated phenomena that didn't even seem to have to do with the, any of the things that were unifying that, 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 that came into the fold. And it became possible to entertain things that were impossible to entertain before. For example, uh, the fact that space and time are unified and that, furthermore, uh, the effects of gravity are to be thought of as some curvature or bending in space-time, made it possible to think about something like the expanding universe, uh, which was simply impossible to think about, in, in the correct way at least, in the, in the Newtonian worldview. When we say the universe is expanding, uh, what's going on is that there's space being created between two galaxies. These are two galaxies. Uh, it's not expanding into anything. It's just that space is being invented all the time at some rate uh, between any, any two points. This is only possible if you realize that space-time isn't this uh, static arena in which things happen. Um, and so this, this, this unification al allowed even these ideas to be entertained. Of course, the ideas are also correct, which is nice. Um, quantum mechanics did, did, did the same thing. Um, uh, things that, that were very disparate before, particles and waves, were seen to be different aspects of exactly the same things. And we now understand that uh, there is actually no such things as waves. Everything is fundamentally particles, but the particles don't behave according to the usual laws of classical mechanics. Uh, they, behave, uh, they obey the laws of quantum mechanics. And this had a number of other dramatic repercussions. The idea of determinism was lost. There's the famous uncertainty principle that we'll come back to over and over again uh, in this lecture. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the flip side of this was that vastly different seeming things in the classical world were seen to be different aspects of the same thing uh, quantum mechanically. So quantum mechanics and relativity is how the 20th century began and much of the rest of the century was devoted to fully understanding the synthesis of these two uh, relatively radical ideas. And the just theoretically, the synthesis of quantum mechanics and relativity uh, forced a very rigid theoretical structure on us in attempting to describe nature. The theoretical structure is a name. It's called quantum field theory. And it has lots and lots of consequences. It's a broad theoretical structure. If you want to describe the world in a way that's consistent with the laws of relativity and consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics, you have to use this, this language. Amongst other consequences, it forced the existence of antiparticles. This is also going to play a role in our story. So uh, you're familiar with electrons and protons, but there also had to be anti-electrons and anti-protons uh, out there in nature with exactly the same properties, but uh, with exactly the same masses, but opposite charges. This was stunning, that, that, that this unification of the, the, the revolutions in the idea of space-time and quantum mechanics doubled the world. There had to be a whole second part of, of the universe that people knew nothing about. It was such a startling prediction that Dirac, whose theory predicted it, uh, really refused to make this prediction himself. Um, uh, but good theories don't care whether the, 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 the theorists pay attention to their uh, predictions. And uh, there really are antiparticles. And they were dutifully discovered by experimentalists uh, 
uh, a number of years after the proposal. Uh, Dirac, of course, uh, before, before the uh, observation, uh, uh, admitted that his theory predicted that these things existed, which was a good thing after they were found. Um, I just want to very quickly give you a flavor of an idea for why this is true. Um, so something that, something that uh, many, many of you have probably heard about in the context of, uh, of, of relativity is that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And there's a basic reason why nothing can go faster than, than the speed of light. If you imagine that you, you, you send a, a message from A to B, so this is time and this is space, you don't need to pay too much attention to the details of this picture, but you imagine you want to send a message from A to B and you can do it going faster than the speed of light, uh, so the speed of light uh, it, uh, uh, would be moving along this, this green line here, so you're going even faster. So it's going from A to B even faster than allowed by, by the speed of light. Then according to the rules of relativity, uh, if another observer came along and observed what happened in, in uh, moving relative to, the, to this picture in which I've drawn it, it becomes possible to reverse the time orientation of A to B. It, it makes it possible for the signal to have been received at B before it was sent from A. So that's a flagrant violation of causality. Okay? So when we say you can't go faster than the speed of light in relativity, it's with, with, uh, with, with uh, an additional assumption that the physics has got to be causal, that, that, that events uh, have to come after their causes. Now that's perfectly fine in a classical world, but now the quantum mechanics comes along with its famous uncertainty principle. You've probably all heard that, that you can't know the position and velocity of a particle at the same time due to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If you know the position very well, you don't know what direction it's going in. If you know exactly what direction it's going in, you don't know its position uh, very well. Well, this, this causes a problem here, because, because uh, uh, in this classical picture, I assumed that, really, there was a signal sent exactly from A. Well, because of the uncertainty principle, it might have been sent from over there. Okay? If it was sent from over there, it could have gotten from A to B in a way that looked uh, consistent with uh, causality, but you actually don't know. Maybe it came from there, maybe it came from there, maybe it came from here. So there's always some chance that the signal sent from A is received from B apparently faster than it's allowed to from the rules of relativity. So there's only one way out. The only way to preserve a causal picture of the wor world is to interpret this sequence of events in a different way. Instead of imagining that there's a negative flow of charge forward in time from A to B, or, or if in this picture would be a negative flow of charge backward in time from A to B, you imagine instead a positive flow of charge forward in time from B to A. That's the only way you can preserve causality and quantum mechanics together. Okay. That's, but for that, for that to work, there must be something out there. There must be a particle in nature with exactly the same properties of the electron that allows this flow of charge forward in time from B to A. There are some holes in this argument, uh, but it's basically correct. Um, and, uh, uh, and indeed, it's true that, that causality in the framework of quantum field theory forces the existence of antiparticles. So already you see there's tension between these two great ideas. There's tension between the ideas of relativity and quantum mechanics. Resolving the tension forces extra structures that were really surprising to, uh, to a people. Okay. One of the consequences of this fact is that uh, something as banal seeming uh, classically is the vacuum of the world is, is, is exciting. Uh, so nothing could seem more boring than the vacuum. Um, but in this picture of the world, uh, even the vacuum has lots of action in it. And the reason is, uh, if you try to look at a region of vacuum to, to confirm that it's boring, uh, how would you do it? Well, you take a magnifying glass. Uh, I apologize, you have to suffer through my art this entire talk. Okay? That is my version of a magnifying glass. You'll have to deal with it many times. Uh, so if you take a magnifying glass and check that this region of space is, is empty and it's boring, well, again, the uncertainty principle uh, uh, causes, causes a problem. Because, uh, because in order to resolve what's going on in a small region of space, you've got to put more and more energy into that. Uh, if you want to resolve smaller and smaller distances, you've got to put more and more energies into that little region of space. And at some point, you put so much energy into such a small region of space that nothing stops uh, particles and antiparticles from being produced out of the vacuum. For this to happen, antiparticles had to exist, otherwise you couldn't conserve charge, for example. Okay? But because antiparticles exist, nothing stops particles and antiparticles from being popped out of the vacuum. And that means the act of trying to check that some region of space is empty instead reveals that there's actually particles and antiparticles there. That means that it's useful in thinking about physics to imagine that the vacuum isn't empty, but is roiling with the sea of particles and antiparticles all the time. 
Okay? So that any, if you have that picture in your head, you won't get the wrong answer. Okay? If you have that picture in your head, you'll be guided to the correct way of thinking about what is going on. And any experiment that you do that checks the properties of the vacuum at short distances will, will reveal the sea of particles and antiparticles. So if you had some boring picture of a point-like electron, uh, maybe it's electric fields going, uh, lines going all the way out to uh, infinity, what actually happens as you go to short enough distances is you see there's electrons and anti-electrons. Uh, popping ar around it all the time. At even shorter distances, you'd see heavier particles, muons and antimuons. I don't know why I drew a muon and an electron. It's a muon and an antimuon. Every everything in nature and its anti-thing uh, shows up as you go to small enough distances. Um, so even the properties of the vacuum are exciting. Now, all of these developments, th these were, I told you some of the qualitative things, but these developments culminated in the 1970s with the invention of a specific quantum field theory. The, 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 it's a general theoretical structure, but there's a specific quantum field theory um, that describes all known interactions down to distances of at least 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And this theory is spectacularly successful. Some of you have maybe have seen uh, qualitative pictures like this uh, in uh, other contexts. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid that, uh, that, that these pictures convey some idea that there's some everything goes wild west down in the subatomic realm and there are all these fuzzy pictures. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I assure you that, 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 these, that these are metaphors for something which is a very powerful mathematically accurate machinery that lets you make in incredibly accurate predictions about properties of the physical world that actually work. So this, this qualitative picture uh, that, that there's this cloud of, uh, of uh, particles and antiparticles surrounding the electron, for example, has a number of remarkable quantitative uh, consequences that have been measured to incredible precision. For example, one of the consequences is, is that the strength of the electric charge uh, actually gets gradually stronger as you go to shorter and shorter distances. When you're at very large distances, you don't see this big cloud. But as you get to shorter and shorter distances, you penetrate this crowd, uh, this cloud of particles and antiparticles surrounding the electron. And you see an effective charge that gradually gets, gets stronger. Very gradually, but it gets stronger. This is a measurable effect. It's been measured accurately to parts in 1,000, parts in 10,000, and it's, and it's true. There are some special cases where uh, life is so good that we get to make incredibly accurate predictions, because uh, the theoretical prediction can be made with extreme accuracy, and the, experimental, uh, and the experiment can be done to incredible accuracy. Here is the sort of poster child for that, uh, uh, for that in, in, our, in our current theory. There is a particular property that the electron has. Uh, the electron spins. It's like a little magnet. In fact, the, the reason why things are magnetic is ultimately has to do with the fact that you, that you can roughly think of the electron as a little spinning top of, uh, of a charge. And so it has a certain amount of how magnetic it is. Well, in some approximation, in some units, uh, uh, that amount of how magnetic it is is two or one. But there's a, there's a, uh, this whole picture of the cloud of particles and antiparticles around it predicts a very precise deviation uh, from that value. Okay? And so here it is. The, this is the true value, subtracting the, the value that it would have, uh, how magnetic it is classically, is this number that I've written out. So you have gone out to 12 decimal places. And I haven't bothered telling you whether that's the experimental number or the theoretical number, because they agree to 12 decimal places. Okay. So this isn't a joke. This is, a, this, is, this is an incredibly powerful uh, theoretical framework. And it's an incredibly beautiful theoretical framework that, uh, that, that allows us to make these, uh, these, these uh, uh, to understand with incredible quantitative precision uh, what is going on at, at very, very short distances. Now, I want to just pause for a second, uh, because I, I said at this point in the talk, uh, the word beauty came up, and it'll come up a number of times again. This is something else that I want to, uh, uh, I want to say a little bit about, because often we talk in theoretical physics about theories being beautiful or ideas being beautiful. And I think um, uh, uh, also mathematicians talk about uh, uh, the same thing very often. And, um, uh, but it, it, it's very important to realize that this notion of beauty is not, uh, is not the standard notion of beauty that, that, that we associate with the other things that also as a, a physicist and mathematicians uh, we enjoy. To give you an example of what the beauty in theoretical physics is not like, <laughs> 
So this is one of my very favorite paintings. It's a Lady of Shalott by uh, Waterhouse. Um, if you know anything about, uh, if you know anything about the story or Tennyson's poem, um, it's impossible not to look at that picture and uh, and not see something haunting, tragic, uh, clearly heartbreakingly beautiful. Um, what makes this beautiful is uh, a huge number of things, um, many of them quite complicated, um, and but it, it clearly uh, doesn't suffer from its romanticism or its decadence. Okay. That's not, what the kind of, that's not the beauty that we talk about in theoretical physics. The beauty we talk about is much more austere. Uh, it, it's, it's much more severe in, in many ways. It's much more minimal. It's not decadent. It's not uh, profligate. Uh, it's about how perfectly everything works. And, and, and what it fills you with isn't uh, a sense of uh, melancholy or tragedy, but a sense of wonder that, that the world can work in such amazing ways even more amazing than, than, than you may have realized uh, before you understood what, what is going on. And ultimately, it's a sort of beauty that, that gets its beautifulness from, its, from being inexorably tied with truth. And this explains why uh, the Institute has such a wonderful history in physics, uh, because right there in the logo <laughs> is the intertwining of truth and beauty. <laughs> and that's really uh, what we're after. Um, and, uh, and you know it when you see it. And uh, this theoretical structure, this basic theoretical structure of uh, quantum field theories, I think one of the most beautiful things that we've discovered um, uh, in, in science, and the fact that it works is, is, is stunning. Uh, so I say all of this because uh, a lot of the rest of what I'm talking about are, we'll be talking about some of the difficulties that this picture of the world is uh, leading us into. But I, I really want to stress that it's, uh, it's been a spectacular accomplishment. And to finish the story, uh, we now understand that all of the interactions in nature, uh, electricity, magnetism, uh, the weak force, the strong force, gravity, everything is, in some approximation, uh, uh, well described by this uh, theoretical framework. Everything, all the forces are associated with stick figures like this that were invented by, uh, by, by Richard Feynman. So electrons interact with photons through a little uh, uh, through a little stick figure like that. Electrons and neutrinos interact with uh, particles that carry the weak interactions called the W. You don't need to pay any attention to the actual details, but, but the weak interactions are associated with an identical looking stick figure. The strong interactions, which we now understand, really take place inside the nucleus between quarks and gluons, which are the constituents of the uh, atomic nucleus, are associated with exactly the same kind of stick figure. There are some detailed differences. Gluons also interact with each other. Uh, through a stick figure like that. Photons do not. But these are detailed differences. In the, in the big picture, everything is described by exactly the same three-point basic uh, interaction. Uh, even the interaction of electrons and, uh, and uh, well, of all matter and gravity is associated with, 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 with a picture like that. And let's say you want to talk about how when two electrons uh, approach each other, they, they repel and they scatter. Well, it's simply associated with taking these stick figures and putting them together in every possible way to draw a picture of what happened in space and time. So that is a picture for how electrons bang into each other. Exactly the same sort of picture can tell you how an electron and a positron annihilate into a muon and an antimuon and so on. And this is really the most important lesson that we learned uh, in, uh, um, in, in the second half of the 20th century, is that the apparent huge disparity between all of these forces that we are talking about, and they seem utterly different from each other, this apparent huge disparity is a long distance illusion. And at short distances, at short enough distances, uh, they all are essentially described by exactly the same mathematical structure. So, for instance, uh, the strong interactions look nothing like electricity and magnetism. They're confined to tiny distances inside the atomic nucleus and so on. And we discovered further that uh, they're, they're really acting on quarks and gluons inside the atomic nucleus. But, but if you go to short enough distances, in fact, in this case, shorter than 10 to the minus 14 centimeters or so, you see that they look exactly the same as everyone else. It's just that this effect that I talk about that gradually changes the strength of the interaction for electrons happens to, for detailed reasons, not particularly fundamental reasons, just kind of detailed reasons, happens to go the other way. And the strength between quarks, instead of getting stronger as you go to shorter distances, gets stronger as you go to longer distances, very gradually. 
But eventually, it becomes very strong at around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters, and that's why you can't pull quarks apart from each other. That's why all these interactions are confined to very, very short distances. So uh, 10 to the minus 14 centimeters from the point of view of, uh, of, of microphysics is a very mac macroscopic scale. We didn't happen to know it for 2,000 years because we were stuck with our crummy low energy uh, experiments. But uh, as we go to high enough energies and short enough distances, this basic similarity between all the forces and interactions became manifest. Similarly, the reason why the weak interactions seem so different than all the other interactions had to do with, again, a very short range for this interaction, which if you go to short enough distances, in this case around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, again, the, the, the difference disappears and everything is described by the same kind of ideas. So uh, people talk an awful lot about speculative ideas for unification which are very exciting and are, and are, and are important, but it, it, but it should be emphasized at some, at some basic level, we already have, uh, we've already taken a huge leap towards the idea that all the forces are in fact different aspects of the same thing because we're describing them in exactly the same mathematical language. And this only became possible when we realized that the similarity shows up at short distances. This is why we do particle physics. Often this part of uh, science is described as the quest to understand the structure of matter at the shortest distances, or what the fundamental building blocks of matter are. That may be true for some people, but it's certainly not true for me. I really couldn't care less about the particles at all. Um, it's not that the particles themselves are interesting. It's the laws that are interesting. And the particles tell us something about the laws. Think about the particles as the alphabet. We're interested in the novel. Uh, we don't care so much even what language it's, it's written in. <laughs> But, uh, but we need to figure out what, uh, what, what they're telling us about the uh, underlying laws. Uh, the rest of it is, is chemistry, which is perfectly, perfectly interesting, but you know, it's, it's more fun to blow things up in a lab than uh, if, if you want to just, just, just do that. It's really the laws that we're interested in. All right, so you, you don't need to pay any attention to this in detail, but just, just, just so you know, uh, this picture of stick figures of all the particles and, and, and forces is really there. We have lots of different kinds of particles. They have these kind of stick figure interactions with different kinds of particles. And this is this menu, together with a precise set of mathematical rules for figuring out how to put these things together, really describes nature down to 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And you can put it on a slide. So this picture, as I said, works spectacularly well. It not, has not been. Uh, uh, it's not been ruled out. Uh, it, no experiment over the past 30 years, uh, um, which would have dearly loved to have found a crack in this structure, uh, has, has, has revealed one. The typical kinds of precisions that, that uh, where there's agreement between theory and experiment, getting an agreement to a part in 1,000 or a part in 10,000 is by now routine. Okay? Uh, in, some, in some very, very special cases, we get those 12 decimal uh, accurate, uh, accurate level predictions when in the happy circumstances of what theory and experiment uh, can, can, can both be done very, very accurately. But again, the sort of precision we're, not, we're talking about is not a kind of works. You know, when we say things work in physics, they work. They work to factors of, uh, to accuracy of a part in a thousand, part, part in 10,000. 10, and if you have any question, I also want to emphasize essentially, not essentially, every question about the world around us, okay? Every question at least about the underlying uh, uh, laws of physics uh, from which you could, in principle, derive answers for the world around us. Of course, not in any practical way. But, uh, but every phenomenon that's relevant for the world around us is described by this theory. Um, that wasn't true 50 years ago. That wasn't true 30 years ago. Well, it, it wasn't true 40 years ago. It was true 30 years ago. There were questions you might ask 40 years ago that are relevant for the macroscopic world around us about radioactive decay, for example, that, that, uh, that was not fully understood then. Every single question about, that's relevant to the world around us is now part and, and really addressed in, in this theory. You might find that, uh, you might find that a little disappointing that, that, that so many of the, uh, of, of, the, of the questions around us have been, in a sense, answered. But actually, many of us find that extremely exciting. People have been wondering for 2,000 years about deep things uh, having to do with the structure of space and time um, and the fundamental laws of nature. And, uh, and I think you could say that, that, uh, that it was the wrong question, it was the wrong time to ask the very, very hardest questions the entire time up to this epoch. It was the wrong time because we had to barrel through all these other 
Very, very important things to understand about the world around us, but we have to barrel through all of them in order to get to a point where the questions we're asking are really directly tied to, these, uh, to, to the very, very deepest questions that, uh, that, that got people uh, excited about, um, uh, uh, about science 2,000 years ago. So, uh, so the fact that, uh, that so many things are explained means that the questions that are not explained are really directly confronting some of the very, very deepest ones. So any question that, that you can ask, there is in principle, about the world around us, there is in principle an answer to um, in, in, in this theory. There is one element of the theory that has not yet been, been confirmed, which is really the first order of business at the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider. A very basic question you can ask about the world is, why, do, why are atoms small? Okay. So why are atoms small? That, 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 that's a good question. Atoms are small, well, because electrons whip around the nucleus. Uh, so you rapidly turn the question into, um, why do the electrons have a mass, the mass that they have? Because if electrons were a lot lighter, let's say electrons didn't have any mass at all. They'd zip around to the speed of light, and atoms wouldn't exist. They'd be infinitely big. Okay. So you can ask a, a basic question. Why do electrons have a mass? That's, that's a very basic question about the world. And, uh, and the masses of... Uh, other particles as well, you can ask the same question for. And in this theory, in this specific quantum field theory, the answer for this question uh, is, at least a cartoon for the answer is the following. And I, and I apologize, because um, in, in all the years of, uh, I've, I've given talks on the subject, I've never managed to give a, a sort of convincing uh, or, 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 or correct to the true explanation cartoon version of the uh, argument here. Um, um, uh, but I, I, will, I will do it anyway. Um, so uh, the idea is that, that the universe is filled with a kind of condensate, with a kind of fluid. Uh, immediately when I say that, people say, isn't that just like an, like an ether? Didn't you idiots learn anything? A hundred years ago you had an ether, you have an ether again. Well, all I can say is that this is a kind of fluid that's not like the ether. <laughs> okay? uh, um, but uh, it, it looks the same to every observer. Um, it, it's a kind of fluid that's not like the ether. But anyway, as an electron moves around, it just bangs into this condensate every now and then, and that's what gives it an inertia. It has some interaction with this, uh, with this fluid. Uh, and that's what gives it inertia, and that's where its mass comes from. There are other particles that have much, much stronger interactions with this, uh, with, this, uh, with, this, uh, with this fluid, and they're correspondingly much heavier, while things like the photon, for good reasons, have no interactions with it at all, and that's why they're, they're exactly massless. But now this is the important point. The typical, what the theory needs is that the typical length scale between these collisions is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. I told you that this 10 to the minus 17 centimeters was an interesting scale, A, because we're about to go there experimentally, but B, because we've known about it for a long time. And this is why we've known about it for a long time. Uh, uh, we've known about it more indirectly for a very long time, but in the context of this specific theory, 10 to the minus 17 centimeters is a physical length scale in nature. It's the typical distance particles go uh, before they bang into this condensate and acquire their inertia and their mass. So what this means is when we bang particles into each other at very high energies at the LHC, we're going to put excitations in this condensate. The typical wavelength of those excitations will be 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And uh, they will be, in, those excitations are interpreted as a production of a new particle. That particle is the famous Higgs particle many of you have heard about, which is one of the things that uh, that, as I said, is going to be one of the first orders of business to confirm the existence of at the uh, LHC. Okay, but we have not seen that directly yet experimentally. All right, so that was, uh, that was a review. Uh, so now I want to uh, tell you about what, what these two major problems are that, that, uh, that this picture of the world has, has, has forced us into. Um, and this one I'm going to have to be relatively brief about. Uh, but it is it is it is important for for the for the second part of uh, uh, of our of our discussion. So uh, one of the major one of the major challenges we, we face is that this idea of space time doesn't really exist um, and has to be replaced by something else. That's uh, that's uh, so coming back to this picture down at around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, we believe the notions of space and time just break down. So why is that? Um, well, first of all, let me tell you something about uh, let, let me tell you something about that scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Uh, if you look at the force between a pair of uh, electrons, uh, that force is 42 orders of magnitude stronger than the force uh, than the gravitational uh, attraction between the pair of electrons. Uh, it turns out that uh, that 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 this electric force is actually characterized by a relatively small 
number. It's not. It, it's not. It's much much stronger than uh, than uh, gravity. But the, but uh, the, there is a pure number, roughly one over one thirty seven, that's associated uh, with the strength of the uh, uh, electric interaction. On the other hand, the gravitational constant, Newton's constant, uh, it turns out is really associated with a very very tiny length scale, around ten to the minus thirty three centimeters. If you work in the appropriate units, uh, electricity, the, the the electric force, really the strength is. is Roughly speaking, a pure number. But the strength of gravity isn't a pure number. It has a scale in it. It's around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That scale is also called the Planck scale, the Planck length. And the fact that this is so small means that th there's no sense in which gravity is just weak or just strong. If your distance is much larger than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, it's amazingly weak. But around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, it becomes amazingly strong. So if you do this experiment, you take a pair of electrons and you start bringing them closer and closer to each other, well, you probably learned in high school that both the electric and the gravitational force laws are an inverse square force law. Uh, so you would think that the ratio of the forces uh, will, will stay uh, constant. But this changes when the electrons get closer to each other than around 10 to the minus 11 centimeters. When you do that, you have to put more and more energy into just hold the electrons at smaller and smaller distances. This is the uncertainty principle over and over again. So putting it to, uh, to holding them at shorter and shorter distances requires you to put more and more energy there. Energy is equal to mass via equals mc squared, and it gravitates. So that increases the gravitational, interac uh, the, the gravitational um, attraction between the uh, electrons. And, and, and that just keeps going. So, so then the gravitational force starts rocketing up relative to this minuscule value. And the two forces become equal to each other at around 10 to the minus 31 centimeters, actually. Okay. Um, then at around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, gravity completely overwhelms everything else and is, uh, and is just a mammothly strong force. In no sense is it weak in any way at all. Okay. So that's one feature. That 10 to the minus 33 centimeters scale is associated with the extreme weakness of gravity. Uh, but, uh, this is the thought experiment that tells us that there's no space time. Um, so let's take my magnifying glass again and look at a, a, a tiny region of, of space. Um, remember, to see what's going on in a tiny region of space, I need higher and higher energies in a smaller and smaller region of space. And if there is no gravity, this is great. This strategy works forever, so long as there is a big enough government willing to give money to build bigger and bigger accelerators, bigger and bigger microscopes to probe shorter and shorter distances. But when you have gravity, this breaks down at some point. You put so much energy into such a small region of space that, again, that energy has mass, and that mass can get so big that it collapses the region that you're looking at into a black hole. And no information can get out from that black hole. So that's too bad. You were trying to dis discover what's going on at very short distances, but uh, any information from the region you're probing can't make it out because you made a black hole. What if uh, you say that that's really too bad? I'll try even harder. I'll build an even bigger ex accelerator, a bigger microscope. What's going to happen? We'll just make a bigger black hole. You're even more stymied than, than you were before in trying to determine what's going on at very short distances. So this tells us that there's no operational way of measuring anything that's going on at distances and times that are small compared to this, uh, uh, compared to this Planck scale. And every time this has happened to us before in the history of physics, that there's some notion that can't even be in principle, associated with something observable, uh, it means that that notion is approximate and it's got to be replaced by something else. But in this case, the thing that is approximate is space-time itself. Um, and that's really tough because physics, if nothing else, is about describing things in space as they move along in time. So the fact that space-time itself has got to come out uh, of something else uh, is, uh, is one of the tallest uh, orders and one of the biggest challenges to theoretical physics today. This is what string theory is all about and, and offers us the, the, the best ideas we have for how to deal with this problem. I won't have time to uh, talk about it uh, uh, in, in any detail. Let me just say that, that, that these issues do become important. They become important at places uh, like near the center of a black hole or near the uh, Big Bang, where the arguments that I, I told you just tells our theories just break down. We just cannot predict what happens there. We can't predict what, what happens there. And this is what string theory is, is all about. And as I say, it, uh, it's provided us lots and lots of uh, uh, clues for, for the answer to this, uh, to this very deep, deep question, um, but which I won't have time to talk about in, uh, in detail. So let me move uh, to the second set of problems. 
uh, which uh, has to do with this basic mystery of why there is a macroscopic universe. So again, uh, we have these different uh, uh, length scales, these tiny length scales. This is weak length scale. I remind you is the typical distance particles in your, the electron as it's orbiting around the atom, every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so bangs into this condensate, which is why it has inertia, which is why it doesn't fly off and, uh, and stay orbiting around the atom. This Planck length is uh, where gravity becomes incredibly strong, space-time breaks down, and so on. These are the two microphysical scales, very important length scales we know about in nature. Meanwhile, we have this gigantic, huge universe. And as I mentioned, understanding this big disparity is actually a very significant theoretical paradox. And it has to do, once again, over and over, uh, I, I'm stressing this because uh, uh, notice this vacuum being exciting, which is the source of all the problems, right? The source of all the problems, the source of problems that we just talked about before, and the source of problems that uh, now is just a direct consequence of the unification of space-time and quantum mechanics, okay? It's not some second or some tertiary thing that's vaguely related to these founding uh, pillars of our understanding from the last century. It's hardwired in to the very same things that work spectacularly well in all these other experiments, that the structure that works spectacularly well, coming along for the ride with exactly the same structure are these, are these puzzles. And, and uh, um, so that's why I'm stress stressing this over and over again, because it's just the same basic issue. Uh, quantum mechanics and relatively imply the existence of antiparticles, which means that there's gigantic uh, fluctuations in the vacuum. Those fluctuations, quantum mechanical fluctuations of the vacuum, which get larger and larger as you go to smaller and smaller distances. And as we'll now see, uh, that makes it very hard to understand why there's a macroscopic universe. So in fact, the vacuum is not only exciting, it's way too exciting. Um, and it has to do um, with the fact that these quantum fluctuations tell us that even the vacuum has energy in it. Uh, if we go back uh, to a simpler uh, situation, imagine you have a ball hanging on, a, on uh, just a, a pendulum, a ball hanging on a, on a string. In, in, a, in a classical picture of the world, you might imagine that the minimum energy this ball has is zero. It could be just hanging at the bottom and it has no velocity, so it's just sitting there. It doesn't have any kinetic energy, it doesn't have any potential energy. But in a quantum mechanical world, that's impossible. You can't know for a fact that it's hanging down and that it's not moving at the same time. So it's doing one or the other and it has a little bit of energy, no matter what. In fact, there's a very simple formula you can remember for how much energy it has. If there's a frequency for how quickly this pendulum is oscillating, you just multiply that frequency by Planck's famous constant, uh, and that gives you an, an estimate for the amount of, of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanical energy that, that the ball has. Notice that this, this, this energy gets bigger and bigger as the frequency gets higher and higher. So let's now go back to uh, our picture of the vacuum. So here's a box of vacuum. Well, in this box of vacuum, we have these fluctuations that we just talked about, these uh, particle-antiparticle fluctuations that, that, that we just talked about. And well, uh, in, in, a, in a box this size, the typical size of the fluctuations are about as big as the box. So there, there, are, some, there are some energy stored in that. In an even smaller box, there's an even shorter wavelength, higher frequency, even more energy is stored in the fluctuations in that smaller box. In an even smaller box, there's even more energy. This is a real problem because, uh, because if we go to really, really short distances, we have a gigantic amount of quantum mechanical energy that's stored in a minuscule amount of space. There's a huge amount of energy density, if you like. Okay? In, in every little cube of space, uh, you would predict a gigantic amount of quantum mechanical energy, so there should be huge vacuum energy. Now, this has an immediate problem um, uh, because, uh, again, we learned um, from e equals mc squared that, uh, that energy and mass are closely linked to each other. Um, and, uh, and so this energy in the vacuum actually gravitates and it curves space and time. So, uh, so we would expect to have a gigantic amount of curvature in space and time from this argument. Let's actually get an estimate for how big this energy of the vacuum is. Okay. Well, there's some energy in those little boxes, um, and there's some volume in those boxes. The energy is getting bigger as the box gets smaller. The volume is getting smaller as the box gets smaller. So just like we said, this energy density is getting gigantic as the box gets smaller and smaller. In fact, naively, the energy density should be infinite because I can make the, the box arbitrarily small, and the energy becomes arbitrarily big. But we just went through this whole song and dance uh, 
10 minutes ago about how space-time is doomed at around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole idea of space and time ceases to make sense around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's good. That blocks us from a really encountering this infinity. The energy can't be infinite. The box can't get arbitrarily small. It can't get as small as 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. OK, maybe we don't know what's going on in 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Let's stop at 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, 10 to the minus 29 centimeters, anywhere you like. Okay? Uh, but somewhere in that vicinity, you're still going to get a gigantic amount of energy in a, in a tiny, tiny box. If we take it somewhere in the neighborhood of this Planck scale, uh, we get an, a, a, an estimate, which is a Planck energy divided by a Planck volume. Now, I just told you that this, uh, that this, this energy should curve space and time um, uh, because, uh, because it gravitates. It has, it, roughly, it has mass and it gravitates. So let's estimate. Uh, what kind of curvature of space and time it would cause. For this, you don't need to know any equations. You don't need to uh, know anything about, uh, about the detailed structure of general relativity or anything like that. You just have to realize that there's just one word that has made an appearance over and over and over again on the slide. Planck. Planck time. Planck energy. Planck volume. Gravity, remember, is associated with the Planck scale. There's just a single word associated with all of this, which is Planck. And that means that any curvature to space and time that's induced by this will be Planckian. You don't have to do any work. Okay? And that's, that's, that's the right answer. And if this was a, uh, if, if, if it was a um, graduate student qualifying exam, you'd get an A. Okay? <laughs> um, so that, that means that, that, for example, it would curve space so that the typical curvature would be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Or it could make the universe grow in size uh, explosively, double in size, Every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. 10 to the minus 43 seconds is how long it takes light to travel a distance of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Okay? None of these things looks anything like nature. Okay? Now, one of the most exciting, probably the most exciting experimental discovery in the last uh, 20 years of the universe is accelerating. People uh, people realized by, by looking at uh, distant supernovae, they indirectly figured out the universe is actually, uh, which is expanding, the expansion rate isn't slowing up, isn't slowing down, but is actually starting to pick back up again and is uh, accelerating. Uh, but it's not exploding in size every 10 of the, doubling in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds or so. It's doubling in size every 10 of the 10 billion years or so. So the simplest way of, of uh, explaining this uh, uh, accelerating universe is to say that there is an energy in the vacuum. But how big it has to be is around 120 orders of magnitude smaller than this estimate that we just made on the back of the proverbial envelope. Okay? So I used to call this the biggest error in the history of physics. And then I realized there's no reason to tar any of the rest of the sciences, because I don't think anyone has ever screwed up by 120 orders of magnitude before. <laughs> So I think it's the biggest error uh, in the history of science. Now, uh, and I, I, I don't say this lightly, because um, we're not used in theoretical physics to, we're not used to really screwing up, period. <laughs> Never mind this much. We're used to predicting things that work to 12 decimal places. Okay? So we take this personally. This is not the, you know, oh, well, we don't get it. We're used to having exquisite, precise, control and understanding of nature. So when something like this comes along, it really throws you for a loop. Now, I told you that we have this fantastic theory, and it's spectacularly successful, et cetera, et cetera. Surely, before you ask any fancy questions about magnetic properties of the electron, you should wonder about something like, why is the universe big, or why isn't it curled up at 10 to the minus uh, 33 centimeters? So surely we have an answer to this question, just to get going, right? We do. This is the answer. This is our current answer. The current answer is to say, yep, there sure is this uh, observed value of the vacuum energy, which, which we saw. And yep, there is this quantum mechanical correction to it that we just talked about that let's say in Planck units, in some units, Planck units, I compute it using uh, many graduate student years. And uh, it turns out to be 2.6493781 dot, 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 dot. You go 120 decimal places, there's a 5 there, a 3, 4, et cetera. Okay? And we say, guess what? There happened to be, there happened to be just a classical piece that was sitting there already, contribution to this energy density of the vacuum, that was negative 2.6493781 dot, 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 dot. It agrees to 120 decimal places, and beginning in the 121st decimal place, they disagree. 
That's what we actually do. It looks crazy, but it's what we actually do. We're allowed to do it, we do it, 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 we accommodate a large universe, and then we go on to make all these other predictions that are accurate to 12 decimal places. So it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it, it's not without payoff doing this, uh, but it makes you think there's something wrong. There's something seems wrong about this. For obvious reasons, uh, this activity is known as fine tuning. <laughs> okay? um, and it's a little bit like walking into a room and seeing a pencil standing on its tip. Um, balanced to within 10 to the minus 120 degrees of vertical. Okay. It's not inconsistent, it's possible. It's a solution of Newton's laws for the pencil to be standing on its tip within 10 to the minus 120 degrees of vertical. But if you saw something like this, you would probably wonder that something is up. Okay. You would maybe look for a string hanging from the ceiling, um, or for a mechanism, or something that, 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 that would explain it. Even though it's consistent, you would look uh, for, uh, for a mechanism that would explain it. And this is what we have to do to answer a very basic question. Why is the universe big? Okay. Not some uh, technicality about a uh, sixth decimal place disagreement between theory and experiment and some abstruse experiment no one but specialists care about, but why is the universe big? It turns out that there is an essentially identical problem with understanding uh, why the weak scale uh, is uh, so much tinier as a distance scale compared to the size, uh, well, compared to the uh, uh, Planck scale. And if, remember, I told you that, that, uh, that, that there's this 10 to the minus 17 centimeter scale where the electron goes and hits this condensate and so on. But exactly the same argument, exactly the same giant quantum fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances would lead you to, argue, to, to believe the same kind of naive estimate would lead you to believe that there are huge fluctuations in this, in this background condensate itself, every 10 to the minus 33 centimeters or so. Uh, and that uh, instead of the electron banging into it, every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, it would bang into it about as often as the background itself is fluctuating, which is every 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That would mean that every particle we know and love is 16 orders of magnitude heavier. You and I would all be black holes. Uh, and uh, again, the world would be radically, radically different. Um, now, to deal with this problem, we do exactly the same thing. We adjust two parameters to an accuracy not of one part in 10 to the 120, but one part in 10 to the 30 against each other, and we declare victory. Okay? Um, and we, we, we proceed from there. But that's what we have to do in order to answer another basic question. Why is gravity weak? The unifying problem here, the unifying theme, is that quantum mechanics and relativity, this union of quantum mechanics and relativity, this union of our new notion of space-time and quantum mechanics, uh, forces the existence of antiparticles that makes huge quantum fluctuations uh, possible. There's gigantic quantum fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances, which are so violent that it's very hard to imagine why the universe here looks the same as here, looks the same as here, why there's any kind of macroscopic universe at all. That's the basic tension between a world governed by violent short distance quantum fluctuations and an existence as a macroscopic universe. And I want to remind you that you can't do something like, uh, something as drastic as saying, oh, it's all wrong, none of it makes any sense, none of these quantum fluctuations make any sense, because those same quantum fluctuations are what we can controllably calculate in other situations to get those part in 1,000, part in 10,000, part in 10 to the 12 agreements between theory and experiment, okay? There's something more subtle that these problems are telling us about the way the world works, and we need to figure it out. So this is, this is a summary of the problems, okay? So in order to understand why the universe is so huge compared to the Planck length, that takes a part in 120 tuning. The other one takes a one part in 10 to the 30 tuning. Okay, so that's the question. What controls these violent fluctuations of the vacuum? Why is there a macroscopic universe at all? If these fine tunings didn't happen in our current picture of the world, it would be an incredibly different universe. Um, and so we're trying to understand a very basic fact about the world uh, in asking this question. Now, there's an argument that suggests um, uh, that in order to address this problem, we have to change one of the basic rules uh, in some way. The problem was forced on us by the union of uh, space-time and quantum mechanics, so one of the two has got to be modified in some way. We just, re we just finished saying in, in the, uh, the space-time is doomed part that space-time has got to disappear altogether in the correct description of physics. 
Uh, but on the way there, um, uh, we'll now argue that it's got to be modified before it disappears <laughs> altogether. Okay? Uh, so if you want to solve this problem of these giant fluctuations in the, uh, in the vacuum, uh, uh, so it stands to reason you need to, you need to, you need to modify one of the, at least one of the two things, either the space-time part or the quantum mechanics part. No one has managed to modify quantum mechanics in any sensible way in the 80, in, in 80 years people have been thinking about it. But it is possible to modify the notion of space-time. So if we imagine that you have these fluctuations that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, something new had better happen at around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Let's say we want to understand the problem of why gravity is so weak. Something new has got to happen around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters to just change the picture. Okay, so these giant fluctuations should be removed in some way. Uh, but something has got to happen to modify this uh, basic picture, which is hardwired into this union of relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, so it stands to reason that whatever that is is going to involve some no modification to our notions of space-time at these, at these distances. Okay? Now, what it is can't be some random dinky modification, because it has, it has a job to do. It has to remove these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations of the vacuum. In fact, uh, around 100 years ago, um, people faced a very, very similar problem. Um, if it, uh, classical physicists had this picture of the, uh, and the, and the similar kind of argument was made, and the argument ended up being correct. Um, classical physicists were very confused that when they looked at the uh, energy stored in the electric field surrounding the electron, uh, that energy was naively infinitely large. So that couldn't be right. Uh, so, uh, so they did a little estimate and decided that something new had to happen before around 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Uh, that's the estimate you can do where the energy stored in the electric field becomes comparable to the mc squared energy of the electron itself. And they said something new has got to happen at or before this uh, distance in order to repair this problem. And they had many now understood to be misguided thoughts about what that might be. Uh, but the basic philosophy was right, and we discovered, actually relatively dramatic things had to happen, quantum mechanics and relativity came along, and, and it, instead of this picture, we had a new picture, we surrounded by this cloud of, uh, of uh, particles and antiparticles. The typical size of this cloud is around 10 to the minus 11 centimeters, and it sufficiently smears out this uh, classical picture of the point-like electron that this, that this uh, gigantic infinity they were worrying about was in fact solved by this mechanism. So this sort of argument has come up before. The situation has come up before, where there seems to be this, uh, there, 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 there seems to be uh, a, a crisis involving huge corrections to physical quantities. Um, there is a corresponding uh, need to have some new kind of physics come in that changes the rule in some dramatic way, and it came in just where it needed to come in to solve the problem in the appropriate way. And in this case, it was indeed pretty dramatic. We had to invent relativity and quantum mechanics in order to see how this problem was solved. And I go through this example because uh, my favorite, and I think most people's um, uh, favorite idea for what might be solving the problem today is, is very, very analogous to this. But the general thing that it could be is some extension to our notion of space-time that uh, removes these violent quantum fluctuations. So, so coming back to my pencil analogy, it's like looking and seeing that there's a tiny hand holding up the pencil. Okay, there's some mechanism that's stabilizing it. Right. Now, as I said, the best idea that uh, uh, there, there have been, for the 30 years people have been thinking about this problem, there have been broadly two uh, sets of ideas that have been uh, thought about. Both can be interpreted in some way as an extension to our notion of uh, space-time with a certain kind of extra dimension. Um, uh, somehow in the, in the popular press, um, ordinary, what I'd like to say, call ordinary extra dimensions get a lot more attention. But they're much, much, much less interesting. Okay? Uh, this idea, which is another version of uh, extra dimensions, is a much deeper and more important idea. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I want to I tell you about it. So, so the, the idea is that in addition to our ordinary three dimensions of space and time, there are additional dimensions, but these dimensions are more interesting than just uh, other kinds of dimensions like ours, but wrapped up to small sizes, which are sort of ordinary extra dimensions. These dimensions have the property that the, that the very distances, the, the variables that you use to measure distances in these uh, extra directions aren't like our variables. They're more like a kind of uh, uh, a sort of variable we got used to in thinking about quantum mechanics. Um, these are variables where ordinary variables, 
uh, if you measure distances in meters or any normal number, they have the property that if you multiply the number a by the number b, it's equal to the number b times the number a. But these numbers that are used to measure the distances in these new kinds of dimensions have the property um, that if you multiply the distance in the x direction by the distance in the y direction, you get negative the distance in the y direction times the x direction. a times b is equal to negative b times a. It's not possible for ordinary numbers, but it's possible for these sorts of quantum mechanical numbers. And one trivial, uh, one immediate consequence of this equation is if you multiply something by itself, it's equal to negative itself, so it has to equal zero. And that means that you can't take more than one step in any one of these directions. Okay? You take two steps, you get zero. So, so, so in a sense, it, it, it's quite limited. You have, this, uh, you have this quantum dimension of space. We can have um, ordinary particles flying around, but when they take their single step in the extra direction, they look, uh, uh, their projection in our four-dimensional world is another particle with nearly exactly the same properties, the same charge and everything else, but some detailed differences. Uh, every particle out there is, would have, again, this would double the world again, um, just like uh, going from, uh, from matter to matter and antimatter doubled the world. Here, every particle out there, the electron would have a partner um, called its super partner, the selectron. A quark would have a partner called the squark. The photon would have its partner called the photino. The names were invented in the 70s when people enjoyed making silly names for things. Uh, um, and the uh, detailed differences it has is that the, the electron is like a little spinning top, this electron doesn't spin. The photon is, a sp is like a spinning top that spins around twice as fast as the, as the electron. The photino spins as fast as the electron does. These are relatively detailed differences. But importantly, there's a perfect symmetry between everything going on in the ordinary dimensions and everything going on in the quantum dimensions. And this solves the problem of the violent vacuum fluctuations in a beautiful way. I told you that you needed something dramatic to solve this problem. It had to change the rules in a basic fundamental way, and it changes the rules in a basic fundamental way. As you decrease the size of this box, the fluctuations are getting bigger and bigger, more and more violent. But then you get down to around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, where the idea is you first start seeing these quantum dimensions. Now, there has to be perfect symmetry between what's going on in our dimensions and what's going on in the quantum dimensions. But you can't have violent fluctuations in the quantum dimensions. That's impossible. You can't even take two steps in those directions, never mind fluctuate wildly back and forth in them. Okay? So it's impossible to have violent fluctuations in the quantum dimensions. So what gives? The only way out is for these violent fluctuations to actually also be gone in our ordinary dimensions. Okay? So the, this perfect symmetry between the ordinary and the quantum dimensions, together with this unusual anti-commuting property <laughs> of distances in the quantum dimensions really removes these violent, uh, the most violent part of the quantum fluctuations as you go to very short distances. Okay? So this is an extension of our notion of space-time that gives a big answer to the question, why aren't there violent quantum fluctuations? Why is there a macroscopic universe? Okay? It, takes, it takes a big answer. And in this case, the, uh, the big answer is there's an extension to, to our notion of space-time called supersymmetry. Okay? All right, this I don't have time to talk. And we also have some indirect reasons to believe that this picture of the world is, is, is correct. Um, for instance, I, I, I told you that this wonderful theoretical structure that we have that, that works uh, to such great accuracy um, allows us to think about the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces in roughly the same way. Um, and in, in detail, they even have almost similar strengths of their interactions. And because the strengths of these interactions change very slowly as we go to shorter distances, you might imagine that they might become much more similar to each other as you go to shorter distances. And indeed, if you just take the theory we know and love, they, they do. They get more similar as you go to short distances, but they don't quite become exactly the same. It's, 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 it's interesting, but it's not, uh, it's not exactly the same. However, if we add the effects of uh, these quantum dimensions of space, these calculations change, and we find that these three lines converge shockingly to a point to percentage accuracy. Okay? This did not have to happen. This had nothing to do with the, uh, the, the whole motivation for introducing this idea had to do with, with um, what, what we just talked about, removing the violent fluctuations, uh, getting a macroscopic universe, um, and something that comes out automatically. 
uh, is that uh, we can now entertain a possibility that, 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 that Einstein at this institute spent 30 years trying, um, but that in fact all the strengths of all the interactions are the same. Uh, and there, there is a more unified um, theory linking all of these forces uh, at very, very short distances. Now the distance where these things come together is around 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, which is, again, amazingly not far from where gravity catches up with everything else. None of this had to happen, um, um, but, but it did. And it's a strong hint that this idea is on the right track. And this is the real reason why this is considered by many people to be more likely some, than some of the other ideas. In the 30 years that we've been imagining what might happen next, this is the one circumstantial bit of evidence that we have that positively points to any of the ideas being right, and it, and it favors this one over the, over, the, over the rest of them. However, you may have noticed that I uh, uh, spent a long time discussing this um, 10 to the minus, the, the problem of understanding the weakness of gravity, uh, what's happening near 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, and I didn't talk at all about this problem of understanding why the universe is so big. Um, and it turns out that if you make the same kinds of arguments to try to solve this problem, you get a completely incorrect answer. Um, so we, we're really still left with a major mystery for why the universe is so big. This is such a big mystery that, uh, that, that, that people have resorted to a completely different style of explanation to try to explain some of these, uh, uh, some of what looks like incredible fine adjustments in the parameters in our understanding of the universe. And I, won't, I don't have too much time to talk about it, but I'll just give you a, a cartoon. The cartoon is that uh, it is, it's again a modification of our ideas of space-time. Now not at short distances, but at the very, very, very largest distance scales. And the idea is that on extremely large distance scales, vastly bigger than the size of the observable universe, the, there is a bigger multiverse um, uh, where uh, where various properties, things like the mass of the electron or the value of this uh, vacuum energy density or other parameters change. They change from one place to another to another. And that there is a gargantuan number of possibilities for what it might actually be. That number of possibilities, let's call it a number of order 10 to the thousand, just to, uh, just to give us a huge number to uh, talk about. So you might then imagine that on gigantic, gigantic scales, all of these different possibilities are realized somewhere. Now, it's a non-trivial fact, it's a very interesting fact, that, uh, that let's say this value, value of the vacuum energy was a lot bigger. The universe would be exploding in size so rapidly that no structure of any sort could form. Everything would be completely ripped apart before any structure of any sort could form at all. So the vast majority of this multiverse is lethal and empty. Okay? There are all these different possibilities out there, but most of it is lethal and empty. There's a few minuscule, teeny, teeny, tiny fraction of all of these places where, for completely accidental reasons, this fine adjustment between the parameters happened accidentally. Not because there was a mechanism, but because there were so many things could happen or somewhere it was bound to happen. But those are the only places we could find ourselves because those are the only places where things aren't ripped apart. This type of thinking is um, often referred to as uh, uh, anthropic thinking, which is a complete misnomer because uh, uh, it doesn't put humanity at the center of things. Quite the contrary, it makes us 10 to the thousand times less significant than we were before even. <laughs> okay? um, but, uh, but at the moment, it's the best explanation we have. It's the best scientific explanation we have for why the universe is huge. Okay? Um, and many of us hope that we'll find another explanation, but, uh, but it is disturbing that we don't have a uniform explanation for these two problems, for the problem of why the universe is huge and for why gravity is weak. This idea of supersymmetry beautifully explains the problem of why gravity is weak, but turns out not to explain sufficiently well uh, this problem. And so there's this alternate modification of our picture of the universe on enormous scales that, uh, that uh, is the only one we have right now. All right, so I've gone a, a long time over, but I want to tell you, um, oh, so, but just the punchline of this is that if this picture is true, we could be the tiny part of a vast multiverse. If it's true, if, with a gigantic if, if it's true, this would be the modern analog of the Copernican revolution. Um, but, uh, but there's many conceptual problems associated with it. In particular, we don't know how to see the other universes. Uh, and we don't even conceptually know how to figure out if they're really there. Um, but uh, but, but it, it, it is a fascinating question. Um, all right, so let me end. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, 
that's a review of what all the uh, major, the, at least the two major theoretical uh, paradoxes we face in the, in the 21st century, which as I hope you've seen, again, are really a direct consequence of the major successes we had in the uh, 20th century in putting together relativity and, and quantum mechanics. So let's talk a little bit about this experiment that should hopefully help us a lot in uh, at least understanding some of these things. So this is an aerial view of the uh, uh, region just outside uh, Geneva. Um, there's the Alps in the background. And of course, from the sky, you don't see this big red ring on the ground. <laughs> but, uh, but 100 meters underneath that ring um, is where all the excitement happens. And there's, uh, there's a ring. Um, and there's a beam of protons that are made to circulate one way around the ring. Another beam of protons is made to circulate the other way around the ring. They're accelerated to amazingly high energies. And at a few places around the ring, they're made to slam into each other. And in doing so, probe what's going on with the laws of nature at distances around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. This is a picture of what it looks like inside the tunnel deep underground. So you see uh, the ring is around uh, 27 kilometers around. Uh, and uh, 27 kilometers is big. You can just barely see the curvature as you go, go around here. But this is a, is a giant, giant machine. I should say every single, every word associated with this experiment has some superlative uh, uh, associated with it. It's the largest experiment in human history. It's the actually largest experiment from the point of view of the number of people working on it, from the point of view of the actual apparatus, from the amount of data that's being collected. So we, we could go on and on about, uh, uh, about biggest, largest, um, et cetera, and I'll do some of that. Uh, it's an incredibly international experiment. There's, um, uh, there's roughly 6,000 people working on the, uh, uh, on the, on the parts of it that, that, that are of interest uh, to the subjects of, of this talk, and the U.S. has a very significant stake in it. All right, so um, so here's a cartoon of what of what happens. So these protons are accelerated, as I said, one in one uh, way around the ring, another in the other way around the ring, and each one is accelerated to around 0.9999999. That's seven nines times the speed of light. Now, when you do that, each one of them has an energy, each one of these protons has an energy that's roughly 7,000 times uh, its mc squared rest mass energy. Okay? And we slam, them in, we slam them into each other. By the way, when I say we here, uh, as a theoretical physicist, uh, if I did anything, the machine would instantly break. So what I mean when I say we, I mean my wonderful experimental colleagues. And, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll say we just, just to feel cool. Uh, throughout the rest of, of this discussion. So we slam them into each other at uh, high energies. Now the proton, as I mentioned, is 10 to the minus 14 centimeters big. If we look inside it, we see that it's a bag that's made up of these quarks and gluons, these gluons which bind the quarks uh, and keep them uh, inside the proton. So they're very messy things. They're messy things around 10 to the minus 14 seven, uh, centimeters big, a bag of strongly interacting particles. Now, what do you think happens when you take one bag of these particles and another bag and you slam them into each other at very high energies? The dominant thing that happens is they break up. Okay? But they're going so fast that most of the debris from that breakup goes back and forth along the direction that the beams were coming from to begin with. Okay? That is not what we're interested in. That's what happens the vast majority of the time, but it, it's not what we're interested in. Other people are interested in it. It's actually interesting, but it's not what we're interested in. We're interested in probing the laws of nature at very short distances. And, and so there, what we're actually interested in is the head-on collision between, between uh, some of these quarks and gluons in one proton and a quark and gluon in the other proton. You know that a head-on collision took place because the constituents will come out not back and forth along the direction of the beam, but at a relatively large angle compared to the beam. Now, that new stuff happens at around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Uh, and whatever new things are going on is manifested by the production of some new particles. The new particles don't come out wearing a name tag saying I'm a new particle. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of them rapidly disintegrate into ordinary particles that we know and love in a time scale of around 10 to the minus 27 seconds. That's how long it takes light to travel a distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Okay? So what we have to do by reconstructing all these things that come back out, ordinary particles that we know and love, muons, electrons, positrons, 
quarks. We don't really see a quark, but the quark comes along with a whole jet of uh, other strongly interacting particles that, that surround it. We have to put big detectors to surround these particles uh, and study in detail what comes out. And from that, back re reconstruct and infer what it is that happened in here, which is what we're interested in finding out. One of the incredible things about this experiment is that the detectors you have to use to surround the region where all of this uh, happens are the biggest detectors that have ever been constructed. Okay? Now, again, this is ironic. This is an experiment designed to probe the smallest distances that we've ever probed, and it's the biggest experiment. It's 27 kilometers around, and, it's, and it has these most gigantic detectors that have ever been built. Why? It's the uncertainty principle again and again. You're probing tiny distances. You need huge energies. To get those huge energies, you have these gigantic rings that allow you to gradually accelerate the uh, particles up. And you surround them with these huge detectors because they're coming screaming out with gigantic energy. And you just have to stop them, amongst other things, in order to be able to study their, their properties. So these detectors are huge. They surround the, uh, they surround the interaction region. So your beam comes in one direction, comes in the other direction. Something happens here. The whole spray of particles goes out. And you don't need to look at any of the details, but there is an onion-like uh, structure that, that surrounds the, the, the collision point. And the purpose of all of this stuff is to measure the heck out of every single particle that is coming out, know what kind of particle it is, how fast it's moving, with what energy, in what direction, and so on. The scale is, this thing is 24 meters tall. This is one of the detectors called the Atlas detector. It's 45 meters long. There is a couple of grad students for uh, uh, comparison. Uh, and uh, this is a cartoon of what it looks like in there. So, uh, so you, have, uh, you have a collision again. All the particles come out, and they're measured um, uh, in this onion-like structure of the detector surrounding it. This is another picture of the, uh, now of the actual uh, Atlas detector um, before it was all closed up. Now, now of course, there's an actual beam running through here. and It would be very bad for this person to be there right now. <laughs> okay? But again, it gives you an idea of what the thing uh, looks like. Um, and, and how gigantic it is. Uh, there is a second detector doing the kind of uh, experiments we're, we're interested in, um, which is uh, somewhat smaller. Its name is uh, CMS. The C stands for compact. It's a compact muon solenoid. C is compact. It's so much tinier than Atlas. It's such a puny thing. You know? There again is a representative human for scale. Actually. And just to give you an, an idea of, uh, of, of the kind of space these things are housed in. This is the cavern uh, underground where the CMS detector sits. Um, so there, there's a hole there, and that gigantic detector was lowered very slowly through that hole, very, very deep underground. Again, these are people and, and, uh, uh, and brought down there. OK. So back to my pictures. Um, so uh, how, will we, how will we see, for example, if supersymmetry or some other ideas uh, uh, um, are realized in nature. How will they show up at, at, at the LHC? Well, uh, if we imagine, in this case, we have these new quantum mechanical dimensions that uh, we can pop into if, the, if our energies get high enough. When we collide the protons together, um, when, when we collide the, uh, the uh, protons together, uh, the quarks inside the proton can pop off into the quantum dimensions. They will look like the superpartners of the quarks, or the squarks to us. These things very rapidly, uh, very very rapidly decay uh, into ordinary uh, into ordinary particles. In this case, the squark decays to a quark and the superpartner of the photon called the photino. Here on this side, it's a little more complicated. The squark decays to a quark and uh, uh, the superpartner of the W particle, so the W eno, which decays to uh, a positron and and a selectron, which in turn decays to an electron and a photino. All of this chain of decays are happening in the blink of an eye, in 10 to the minus 27 seconds. And what you will be seen in, in the detector are the particles in red, are these, uh, these jets associated with these quarks coming out, these positrons and electrons coming out. Uh, these particles, the superpartners of the photon, uh, turn out to be very, very weakly interacting and actually are not stopped or directly detected in the experiments. And are then the only way you know that they're there is that you see there's some energy and momentum missing from the experiment. 
this is a, what a typical supersymmetry event would look like if it was uh, if it's if it's there. And again, you don't need to look at the you don't need we don't need to talk about the uh, the uh, details. But uh, but there was some interaction happening there. Some superpartners were were, were produced and uh, and decay to ordinary particles. But clearly there was something missing here. Okay, there's energy and momentum missing in that direction. <laughs> And that energy and momentum has been carried away here by this uh, superpartner of the photon. Okay. All right, so that's something that we very much hope to see. Um, we don't. Uh, it's. Uh, we hope something like that is going on to give us a, a mechanism to understand uh, why gravity is is so weak. Uh, something that we really must see um, is is the Higgs particle or something like it. And here too. Uh, uh, there, there are many ways that the Higgs could be, could be produced um, and detected depending on detailed properties, depending on its mass and so on. But one of the dominant things that could happen is two of the gluons in the proton can uh, excite out of the vacuum uh, top quarks, which have this very big coupling uh, to the Higgs, producing the Higgs particle. Um, now, this is an interesting example to talk about because the Higgs really dominantly what it wants to uh, decay, uh, what, what it wants to do, at least in the scenario that I'm talking about here, is to decay to a pair of bottom quarks, a bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark. Now that's, that, that's what it wants to do. But just to give you an idea of the sort of challenges involved here, uh, um, that's very, very hard to see. It, it, it turns out that there are just more mundane ways of making bottom quarks and anti-bottom quarks vastly, vastly more often than this way of making them. So despite the fact that you've gone through all this bother to build this machine, for this process to happen, to make the Higgs, to make it decay to a bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark, this is not the way that you're going to see it. What you have to do is wait for something much rarer to happen. Around one, in, one part in a thousand, uh, the Higgs will decay to two photons instead. That's a process that's, uh, that, that happens through more mundane um, means much, much less frequently. Okay? So when it happens like this, you have a hope of unambiguously associating it with the Higgs. And again, this is not trivial, um, but, but people have been thinking about it for a long time. And in this case, you make use of the fact that the more mundane ways of making these photons uh, don't make the, have the photons coming out with some particular characteristic energy all the time. They sort of come out with a big spray of energies all over the place. Whereas when you, when you produce a Higgs and the Higgs decays to a pair of photons, those two photons are coming out with the same energies all the time because there are two energies that have got to add up to the energy of the Higgs. Right? So if you pair up the two photons, the ones that come from more mundane processes will be distributed over a wide range of values. The ones that come from the Higgs should be peaked up in one location, and that's how you try to find them. Okay? All right. And here's a cartoon that my experimental colleagues will kill me for because uh, it drastically oversimplifies uh, how, how tough everything is, is, is going to be. Um, but, uh, but, but very roughly, uh, how this is going to happen is, is the following. Uh, we have all of these, uh, we, we collide particles with each other, all this spray of particles com comes out, and we're actually after very, very rare things. Um, a typical plot for a number of events as a function of energy uh, of the energy coming out in the event will be completely swamped by ordinary processes that are not the new sorts of physics that, that, that we're interested in, but completely ordinary processes uh, which just vastly outnumber what we're ultimately interested in. Give you an idea of the rates, there's going to be roughly one billion collisions every second. Okay? There'll be roughly 10 top quarks produced every second. In 1995, uh, a handful of top quarks were made at the previous highest energy accelerator in the world at, uh, just outside Chicago. This was a cause for celebration. After seven years, a uh, handful were, were, were made and this particle was finally discovered. Uh, now they're, they're, they're being made uh, uh, a, you know, a dozen every second. Um, and that's, that's an illustration of one of the truisms in this business that yesterday's discovery is, um, is uh, today's background and is tomorrow's calibration. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the, the sorts of things we're interested in, let's say if supersymmetry is there, we're interested in around a squark every minute. So there'll be squarks made every minute or so. Um, so how do we have any hope at all? How do we have any hope at all for seeing the squark a minute over these much, much more uh, 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 things that happen a lot more often? Well, there's two things we've got to do. One of them is figure out how to compute these known things incredibly well. But there's another basic handle that we have, that, that the rates for producing all of this new stuff fall rapidly with energy, 
Whereas if we're making new particles with some characteristic masses, they should all pile up at some higher energy scale. And that's how we have a chance uh, to see it. All right. So I'm done. Uh, so let me just tell you um, uh, what we might know by uh, 2020. So could it be that this machine sees nothing? That's actually impossible. Um, and when I mean nothing, I mean nothing, not the Higgs particle, not, not, not anything. I'm not talking about whether or not practically uh, there might be something there, we'll miss it, and so on. I'm talking, could it be that there's really nothing there? Really nothing there beyond the particles that we've, we, we know and love and, and see, and, um, and have seen already? And that really cannot be. Uh, I don't have time to explain it, but, well, it could be. But if it is, then even quantum mechanics is wrong. And that's incredibly unlikely. There's no reason to expect quantum mechanics to be breaking down. But really, if you believe that quantum mechanics holds, then something must show up. Something like the Higgs minimally must, must show up. Okay? So that's something that, that we might see. Could we see supersymmetry? Well, if we do, I think it would be absolute euphoria. Um, it would be uh, the first extension of our notions of space time since Einstein. And it would tell us that there is the pencil holding up there is a hand holding up a pencil. There is a mechanism that explains at least why, uh, why gravity is weak. It would still leave us a little bit in the dark about this question of why the universe is so big, because as, as I mentioned, supersymmetry doesn't solve this problem. But I think we would be very happy to, to defer this problem to another battle and, uh, and figure out everything we can about how, how supersymmetry uh, is realized um, at accessible energies in nature. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about dark matter, so I won't talk about that. Um, so could it be that we only discover the Higgs and nothing else? This is the one thing which, as I mentioned, quantum mechanics guarantees us. Uh, but could it be that we see the Higgs and nothing else? It's possible. If we see that, I think it will be incredibly confusing. Because for the first time, really ever, um, in a highly controlled situation, uh, we'll have had evidence for some honest fine tuning in the parameter of, of the laws of nature. It's never happened to us before. The sort of problem has occurred. I, meant, I gave you one historical example. The, the same similar thing has happened three times, just in the last 100 years alone. Every single time, it, it has had a nice mechanistic explanation of the sort that we now hope to see. Supersymmetry is a much more dr dramatic example of, but, but the, a, a mechanistic, a nice uh, physical explanation. If we don't see something like that, then really for the first time, we'll have pretty sharp evidence that there is some fine adjustment of the parameters hardwired into uh, the laws of nature as far as we know it. So that would, of course, resonate a lot with uh, the apparent situation we now have with the question of why the universe is so big, why this, uh, this vacuum energy parameter is, uh, uh, is, is, is so tidy. So, um, so the difference between these two pictures is completely stark. Okay? Either we discover a mechanism, and it's an extension of our notion of space-time, or we don't. Okay? So we're really on a knife edge right now. And it's really a difference between a picture of the world which is ruled by order or ruled by chaos. Okay? Uh, there are new extensions of space-time, this picture of unification at very short distances, these quantum dimensions of space, modifying a notion of space-time at short distances versus something which we still won't know for sure is true, but we'd have some more evidence for, um, some more circumstantial evidence for this, uh, this, 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 this picture of a, a vast, lethal multiverse where we live in tiny scraps of places where we can possibly live. Okay? So as I, mentioned, um, so I, I, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, the issues are, are dramatic. Um, the problems are dramatic. And um, the good news is that we're going to have answers uh, one way or another to this question um, on the time scale of uh, 2020. Uh, you should not expect very, very quick results right away. Okay? Uh, I mean, the machine is ramping up, um, not up to its full energy right away, not to the full amount of data right away. It's, it's eventually going to gather around a million times more data than, uh, than it's gathered so far. We all expect and we all hope for something uh, exciting in, in the next announcements, but you know, uh, good things take, take, take time. Uh, but really, by 2020, we should have an answer one way or another on, on this particular issue, at least. Okay? And so, um, so stay tuned. Right. Thanks a lot. Well, Nima has kept us fascinated way beyond the normal 
uh, then to the lecture. Uh, I think it's the first lecture I've been to of Nima's he's actually finished, so that's an achievement. <laughs> um, but I, I, and I know many people are going to want to ask questions, but I'm going to push the question session off into Ford Hall, oh, into the common room, and Nima will be there to answer your questions. So let's thank Nima again. For his <laughs>